Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rovil. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is pulmonary tuberculosis. In this video, we will try to define pulmonary tuberculosis, then discuss its cause, pathogenesis, followed by brief discussions on primary, secondary, and miliary tuberculosis, the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of pulmonary tuberculosis. And at the end, we will also discuss briefly about some atypical mycobacteria, the directly observed treatment short course, which is also known as the DOPS therapy, and multi-drug resistant TB. Okay? So, a lot of topics, so let's begin. First question, what is pulmonary tuberculosis? Now, to understand pulmonary tuberculosis, first, we must know what is tuberculosis. So, tuberculosis, which is often referred as TB in short, is an infectious bacterial disease caused by different strains of the bacteria named Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It can occur in different tissue and organ, but the most common site for this bacterial infection is the lungs. And when there is tuberculosis in the lungs, that is known as pulmonary tuberculosis. The disease is transmitted by inhalation of respiratory droplets or respiratory secretion from an infected patient. Now, one thing you have to remember, the impact of pulmonary tuberculosis in world health is significant. It is estimated that about one third of the entire population of the world may have some form of latent tuberculosis as we will discuss after a while. So now that we have defined pulmonary tuberculosis, now we will move on to the next point and discuss its causes. So I have already mentioned uh, the cause. Pulmonary tuberculosis is caused by the bacteria, that is Mycobacterium tuberculosis hominis, that is the most common strain that uh, can cause pulmonary tuberculosis. And one thing you have to remember, particularly in immunocompromised persons, some other strains of mycobacteria can also uh, result in pulmonary disease. Those other strains of mycobacteria that can also result in pulmonary disease include mycobacterium cancersi and mycobacterium avium intracellulari. So also keep those two names in your mind. So now that we have um, discussed the causes of pulmonary tuberculosis, now let's talk about the pathogenesis of pulmonary tuberculosis. How does mycobacterium tuberculosis result in such infection in our lungs? Now to explain the pathogenesis of pulmonary tuberculosis, you can see that I have drawn an image in the board and let's see what happens to a previously unexposed yet immunocompetent individual when Mycobacterium tuberculosis enters inside his or her lungs for the first time. So drawn on the far left of the board you can see these are the organism. Recall that Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a slender rod shaped organism and also recall that on the surface of mycobacteria there are a lot of glycolipids say for example i have drawn one here this is known as lipoarabino mannan and there are other things also on the surface and recall that alveolar macrophages have receptor for such glycolipid so here you can see the same mycobacteria the receptors, the mannose binding receptors of the alveolar macrophage will bind 
with those glycolipids on the surface of the mycobacteria and that will result in endocytosis of the bacteria inside the macrophage. Then what will happen? Now normally recall that macrophages are phagocytic cells and like all other phagocytic cells whenever they have engulfed something they try to kill it and they try to kill that thing by fusing their lysosome with phagosome but unfortunately in this case that won't be possible mycobacterium tuberculosis has defense mechanism that prevents fusion of phagosome with lysosome and they do that by several ways one of the ways they do that is they inhibit calcium signal and also the second way by which the mycobacterium tuberculosis can prevent fusion of the phagosome with the lysosome is they prevent recruitment and assembly of certain proteins that are needed for fusion of the phagosome with lysosome then what will happen since the lysosome which contained a lot of degradative enzymes to kill the microorganism since that lysosome can no longer fuse with the phagosome so the bacteria inside the phagosome they will have a chance to proliferate and they will proliferate and uh, ultimately they will completely fill the macrophage and they may even uh, later go out from the macrophage into the blood which is a term known as bacteremia presence of bacteria in the blood and via blood the organism can then seed into different organs beside lungs as well but one thing you have to remember all these things are occurring um, before the first three weeks and although before three weeks there is bacteremia however uh, in most of the cases the patient will be asymptomatic or sometimes there may be uh, features of mild flu so that is what will happen in the first three weeks now what will happen after first three weeks after first three weeks the cell mediated immunity will begin and now let's talk about that now before telling you what happens after three weeks I would like to pause and say something about an interesting gene that is known as NRAMP1 so this genes that is natural resistance associated macrophage protein 1 gene so what is the function of this gene in tuberculosis so this NRAMP gene produces a transmembrane protein that is found on the membrane of endosome and lysosome and the function of that transmembrane protein is to pump out bivalent ions from lysosome say for example it can pump out Fe2 plus ferrous ion from the lysosome and the significance of this particular function is it limits the availability of certain bivalent ion that different bacteria would have normally used so that is a protective mechanism now in many individual there may be some problem in this NRAMP1 gene and in those individuals if there is infection by mycobacterium tuberculosis that can um, result uh, in progression of the disease so always keep that thing in your mind that uh, there is a gene called NRAMP1 and if there is some problem uh, in that gene that can uh, result in progression of tuberculosis so moving back to the pathogenesis so we have already talked what happens in the first three weeks now what happens after three weeks after three weeks cell mediated immunity begins so as you can see on the far left we can see alveolar macrophage which was infected by the mycobacterium tuberculosis and now that macrophage is presenting via 
MHC class 2 molecule it is presenting mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen or mycobacterial antigen to T cell okay so you can see this is alveolar macrophage this is the MHC class 2 molecule this is the mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen and um, this is the T cell receptor and this is the T cell then what will happen then the T cell will differentiate into T helper 1 cell now one thing you have to remember interleukin 12 is needed for T helper 1 cell differentiation and interleukin 12 is produced by the cells which encounter the mycobacterium tuberculosis and the mechanism is mycobacteria besides producing a lot of pathogenic molecule it also produces some um, particular molecule that can bind to toll-like receptor TLR2 okay and so those are uh, ligands for toll-like receptor so mycobacterium tuberculosis can produce such uh, ligands for toll-like receptor and once those ligands bind to toll-like receptor 2 that stimulates production of this interleukin 12 and that results in differentiation of T cell into T helper 1 cell. Now this is very important. Once T helper 1 cell is um, differentiated and once it has become mature that will release interferon gamma and interferon gamma is a very important chemical mediator that you have to remember not only for mycobacterium tuberculosis but also for your cell mediated immunity topics you have to remember interferon gamma you know what does it do it activates macrophage and makes macrophage bactericidal now macrophage becomes powerful to kill microorganisms and once macrophage are activated what will happen macrophages uh, will now be able to form phagolysosome and it will start to um, limit the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection so that's one thing T helper 1 cell will release interferon gamma and that will activate macrophages and macrophages will now begin to uh, give us protection at the same time Interferon gamma will also express another molecule and that is known as inducible nitric oxide synthase which is also written like this INOS and that will result in increased production of nitric oxide and that is also bactericidal uh, for the mycobacterium tuberculosis and also there will be another thing that we will see once macrophages are activated they will convert themselves into epithelioid cells epithelioid cells will have sleeper like nucleus and uh, they are modified macrophages so here on the right side of the board you can see I have drawn some epithelioid cells so they derive from the activated macrophages and also sometimes you will see some epithelioid cells will fuse and form giant cells so here you can see I have drawn one giant cell here with multiple nuclei inside the cell and look at the distribution of the nuclei inside the cell they are distributed around the periphery and sometimes often in a horseshoe pattern or circular pattern and this particular type of giant cell that we sometimes see in tuberculous lesion is known as Langhans giant cell and also you can see from this image the central part of the lesion uh, we can see there is some caseous necrosis at the center and it's like the macrophages are trying to contain the infection they are trying to wall off that infection so in the center we are seeing some destruction some caseous necrosis and also remember that caseous necrosis the word caseous came from cheese like so the central part um, is uh, giving an appearance and homogeneous appearance and uh, necrotic appearance so that is known as caseous necrosis and that is surrounded by 
epithelioid cell which are modified macrophages and also surrounded by some giant cell and also some sensitized T lymphocytes are also seen in the picture and this entire uh, type of lesion is known as a granuloma. So that was in short about the pathogenesis of pulmonary tuberculosis and one thing you have to remember although this thing the cell mediated immunity um, gives us protection but at the same time uh, in many individuals it can cause cavitation and other problem. So moving on to the next topic now we will discuss about primary and secondary tuberculosis. So primary pulmonary TB refers to the pattern of TB that we see in a previously unexposed and therefore unsensitized individual. So the primary infection usually occurs in the upper part of the lower lobe and lower part of the upper lobe of the lungs. The initial infection will have 1 to 1.5 centimeter diameter. There will be grayish white inflammatory lesion and that is known as gone focus. And I have already talked about gone focus. So this is in fact a gone focus. And later there will be also lymph node involvement and gone focus along with the nodal involvement is referred to as gone complex. So as you can see I have also drawn a simple flowchart here. So this is primary infection and then there will be primary TB. Now what will be the fate of primary TB? In most of the cases the primary TB is contained. It may either heal and then we will call that healed TB and in that case what happens is the site of lesion becomes fibrosed and uh, later calcified and the calcification may be seen in chest x-ray and those calcifications are referred to as rank complex. So that is one fate of primary tuberculosis. Another fate is primary TB can become latent or dormant in the individual and it may later become reactivated when his or her immunity becomes weakened and that will give rise to secondary TB and we will talk more about secondary TB after a while. So coming back to the primary TB, the third fate of primary TB is it can become progressive primary pulmonary TB and always remember the clinical feature of progressive primary pulmonary TB closely resembles that of acute bacterial pneumonia. Now I have a separate video on pneumonia so you can also look into that but to say in short whenever a person gets progressive primary pulmonary tuberculosis um, he will have consolidation in his middle and lower lung field. There will be also hilar lymph node enlargement which is known as hilar lymph adenopathy and sometimes there may be also pleural effusion present. So these are in short about primary tuberculosis. Now let's talk about secondary TB. So secondary TB refers to the pattern of tuberculosis that develops in a previously exposed or previously sensitized individual. So secondary TB can develop from reactivation of latent tuberculosis that I have just mentioned or secondary TB can also develop via reinfection by mycobacterium tuberculosis. And one thing you have to remember the reactivation is more common in areas of less prevalence and reinfection is common in areas where there is high prevalence of TB. Now in contrast to primary TB when we talk about secondary TB the first thing that we have to mention is the site. The site of secondary tuberculosis is most commonly the apex of the lungs and the reason behind that is Mycobacterium tuberculosis are very fond of oxygen-rich area 
and recall from your physiology classes that apex of the lung has higher oxygen tension and therefore that is the common site of secondary tuberculosis and whenever we talk about secondary tuberculosis there will be some clinical features non-specific clinical features will include fever night sweating there will be sometimes presence of cough and hemoptysis that is um, coughing with blood so these are the common clinical features and also the patient may give history of weight loss weight loss so these are the common clinical features of secondary TB. Moving on to miliary tuberculosis. Miliary tuberculosis arises when there is blood-borne dissemination of TB. Both primary and secondary progressive tuberculosis can give rise to miliary tuberculosis. Now the presentation can be acute but in most cases um, the usual presentation is two to three weeks of fever with anorexia, weight loss, dry cough and uh, sometimes there will be also headache and hepatosplenomegaly and always remember whenever you see headache in such history be very careful because that may indicate presence of tubercular meningitis as well and tubercular meningitis is a very severe and dangerous condition and needs prompt and proper treatment. Now one interesting thing about miliary tuberculosis is the classical chest extra finding of miliary tuberculosis. Classically we will see one to two millimeter fine lesion throughout the entire lung field and they will have the appearance of millet seed and from there we got the term miliary tuberculosis. So always remember presence of millet seed like lesion throughout the entire lung field about one to two millimeter in diameter. Sometimes they may be even coarser as well. Another important finding that we will see in advanced cases of miliary tuberculosis is the presence of crackling sound on auscultation but that is only seen in advanced cases so this is in short about miliary tuberculosis and now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis diagnosis of tuberculosis includes screening test bronchoalveolar lavage for staining and culture chest x-ray etc among other tests Regarding the screening test, we do the tuberculin test, which is also known as Mantu test. And here we add 0.1 ml PPD, that is purified protein derivative, intradermally in the skin of the suspected individual. We inject that thing intradermally and then wait for about 48 to 72 hours and then measure the level of induration. But the problem with this screening test is it cannot differentiate between active and inactive cases of tuberculosis. Moving on to the bronchoalveolar lavage, that is the best possible way uh, to take specimen for staining and culture. And recall that we do not use gram stain to identify the mycobacterium tuberculosis because it is an acid-first bacilli. It has mycolic acid in its cell wall and um, that is not suitable for gram stain. So we use Zeal-Nielsen stain to identify the organism. And we also use a special type of culture media that is known as Lowenstein Jensen media uh, to culture the organism and it takes about six weeks. Polymerase chain reaction are also useful. Moving on to the chest extra finding there will be presence of ill-defined opacity in the lung field and according to the progression of the disease there will be variable level of consolidation, collapse and cavitation and sometimes in severe cases there may be so much collapse that uh, it can displace the mediastinum and position of the trachea. So these were in short about the common diagnostic tests we do to diagnose tuberculosis. Now we will move on to the next topic and discuss its treatment. 
Now if I start telling you the different drug doses and different scenarios of those doses, it will take almost another hour to complete this video. So I will just uh, say briefly, a variety of drug treatment are available for pulmonary tuberculosis and we usually divide these drug therapies into two phases. The first one is the initial intensive phase where our goal is to rapidly reduce the number of the mycobacteria tuberculosis in the patient. And the initial phase is followed by a continuation phase where we try to kill the remaining bacteria from our patient. And usually we give combination therapy and the way to remember, one way to remember the name of the drugs used in combination therapy is to remember the name RIPE, that is R-I-P-E, R for rifampicin, I for isoniazid, P for pyrazinamide and E for ethambutyl. So we give these drugs in combination, however now um, a lot of tablets have been um, made that contain these drugs in combination. So you don't have to take separately these drugs nowadays. Um, tablets containing these drugs in different combinations are now available. So for uncomplicated pulmonary disease in a previously unexposed individual, um, six months of treatment is sufficient and in that six months, two months is the initial phase followed by four months of continuation phase. And uh, if we suspect that the patient has tubercular meningitis, we have to continue the treatment for at least one year. Similarly, if the patient has HIV, besides having pulmonary tuberculosis, the drug treatment should continue for 9 to 12 months at least. Now, one thing you have to remember, it is very important to complete the course of anti-TB medication. If some patient doesn't comply with the proper course of anti-TB medication, there is risk of development of resistance. And to ensure that, there is another technique that is used sometimes and that is the directly observed treatment short course or DOS. And the principle of this DOS therapy is here, the patient takes anti-TB medication daily under supervision of a trained health personnel or similar designated person. And that health personnel or designated person ensures that the patient is taking proper medication in proper dose daily and is not skipping any medication. So that's in short about the DOTS therapy. Now regarding the next topic and that was immunization, vaccine against mycobacterium tuberculosis is available that is known as BCG vaccine which is made from live attenuated strain of mycobacterium bovis that has lost its virulence in human. However, the immunity provided by this vaccine is variable, ranging from 80% to 0%, and the immunity lasts for about 15 years. However, the duration of the vaccine also varies according to the geography and according to the lab where this vaccine strain was produced. So the vaccine is given intradermally in the insertion of deltoid muscle and World Health Organization recommends that all children born in endemic area for tuberculosis should have this vaccine given. So that was in short about immunization. So we will now move on to the next topic and that was multi-drug resistant TB. So multi-drug resistant TB refers to TB that is resistant to at least isoniazid and rifampicin. Recall that isoniazid and rifampicin were one of the two important drugs used in treatment of TB. The resistance develops if 
the treatment was interrupted midway or in cases where the drug doses was insufficient to kill 100% bacteria. Now treatment for multi-drug resistant TB is available. However, here we will use second line anti-TB medication that are more expensive and that have some more adverse effect compared to the first line anti-TB medication. So that is in short about multi-drug resistant TB. So the last topic that we will uh, discuss briefly is about atypical mycobacteria. And the thing I would say is remember tuberculosis occurs due to mycobacterium tuberculosis hominis. However, um, sometimes it can happen by atypical mycobacteria as well. So sometimes atypical mycobacterium can cause pulmonary disease as well. And this is particularly true uh, in case of immunocompromised individual. And among those atypical mycobacteria that can cause pulmonary disease, the important ones are Mycobacterium cancersi and Mycobacterium avium intracellulari. So also keep those two names in your mind. So this concludes today's video on pulmonary tuberculosis. I will also suggest my students to go through their textbooks to look at more information since this is a very big topic. And I will also post some additional image slides in my Facebook page. As for my dear viewers, if you like this video, do comment, share, like and let me know and also subscribe to my channel for more videos. So that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.